Episode 23. Believe it or not, I actually have a guest today. I got out of my little snow cave. Actually, I wish it was a snow cave up in Montana. It's been a little bit light on the snow, hoping that it starts to fall pretty soon. But I got out of my happy place and went on the road and linked up with a very good friend of mine, a longtime friend, John Wellborn, at his Power Athlete Symposium in Austin, Texas. We had a little bit of spare time. Figured the only fitting thing that we could do during that spare time was to throw some microphones on a table and rap a bit. And that's exactly what we did. We tried to squeeze in some high quality stuff in the 45 minutes we had before the kickoff of the symposium. He's an interesting cat. If you take him at first appearances, I think he's just under eight feet tall. Basically looks like a dinosaur, but uh, wears shoes. And if you think of him like that, you're drastically underestimating what the man is capable of doing. I love talking to the guy. Uh, wildly intelligent and, oh yeah, adult language alert. If you listen to this podcast with little ones, uh, earmuffs might be appropriate. There was a little bit of adult language, so you've been warned. If you don't like that type of stuff, don't listen to it. Hope you enjoy it. Should we try to knock out the most awesome podcast ever in 45 it's, minutes? Uh, done. Three, two, one, go. Yeah, most of the time I don't uh, try to put a boundary on the time, but yeah, we're limited on both. Well, actually not on both, but we're limited on time. All right, Austin, Texas. What are we doing here in Austin, Texas? Stop looking at your phone. Put it away. I'm You're so like good. a child. <laughs> <sighs> so what are we doing here in Austin, Texas? This is the 2017 Power Athlete Symposium. Which is? It is a... Fuck, I don't even know what this thing is. It's really just a... a over the year, we run into really cool people through the podcast, just our own personal networks. And it's always cool at the end of the year to bring everybody together for a speaking engagement and just kind of bring everybody in to kind of replug and uh, just a way for us to get together and rally before the end of the year and kind of a, you know, a year in review in a lot of ways. Um, you know, it started pretty small with just a few guys in a gym. I think he spoke that first year where we just uh, wanted a couple people to come in and wanted to train and hang out. And we invited a couple speakers. You were one. I would always get up and give a talk on either vision or culture or, you know, being a CEO or running a company or performance. State of, state of the union type of stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's always good to kind of bring everybody back and just kind of plug everybody back in and, you know, let them hear the message fresh and, you know, what's going on. And uh, a lot of great, great stuff had come out of the years past in that, uh, you know, one year it was, uh, I want to certify all my coaches. So I want everybody to be a power athlete certified coach. So that kind of pushed us with the methodology. People said they wanted to have affiliates with the gyms. And I'm like, ah, I don't necessarily know if I want to have power athlete, you know, Milwaukee out there, but uh, I would definitely allow people to affiliate, uh, you know, and, and carry the banner and say, Hey, we're a power athlete, you know, certified gym. Yeah. Um, you know, people wanted to come and train. They wanted to hear new stuff and, it just kind of grew from there, and now it's kind of grown into this, you know, 300 people, 13 speakers, three days here in Austin, Texas, so it's pretty cool. I mean, definitely larger than last year in Newport, which was an awesome location, though. That building, like the glass all over the place. Yeah, that's at the City Hall. Uh, that whole glass building is is epic. I mean, that was really a cool location and a great venue and super successful. We had some great speakers. So, uh, you know, obviously we moved the company from Newport Beach here to Austin and wanted to try to pick up where we left off. So... I mean, I think I understand what Power Athlete is now, and you and I have a history of kind of where it started and where it all began, but I'm going to let you tell that story. So what, uh, <laughs> what is Power Athlete? Well, and I'll let you tell it in the way that you want to, but also work backwards for people who are okay. unfamiliar. I very rarely on the podcast talk about like any strength and conditioning stuff other than like an initial questions on like, how do I train now? which you could probably rattle off the answer because it's the same way that I trained when I was with you. But so, so we're at a symposium. Take me back in time to when it started. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> um, let me see how, I've, how far back I can take this. I got invited to come to a CrossFit level one in Huntington beach at CrossFit Marina. 
So I cruise over there on a Saturday, walk in, and uh, all of a sudden I sit down to hear Brian McKenzie give up the worst nutrition talk in the history of nutrition <laughs> talks. And as I'm sitting there just uh, a fucking appalled at not only the delivery, all the information, I hear this guy next to me go, what the fuck? And he looks over. And uh, at that point, uh, our friendship was born. That person was Andy Stumpf. And I also believe I looked at you, and just because you were so big, I was like, hey, man, how long have you been a ballerina? <laughs> yeah, you, you, you made some fucking comment. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, slightly longer than your mom. And uh, it just started from there. And it was this epic shit talking. And it just kind of really grew into a friendship, man. We grew into, you know, training partners and friends and, um, you know, just really just exploded from there. And then uh, I went back and played for the Patriots. I was going to say, at that point in time when you, yeah, st- still, you, were, playing you the were still in the NFL, yeah, we'll have to get to that too. Yeah, and uh, I remember uh, competing for the CrossFit Games and fucking filming every second counts. I remember we did like 18 workouts in like seven days. And I remember uh, we were at the Oak Course and I just like started crying. I was like, I don't want to work out anymore. I make an appearance in that movie for people who haven't seen it as John's life coach yeah, and mentor. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean it's uh, uh, you know, and then cross, after I got injured in New England and came home, uh, you know, and then you know Greg Glassman hit me up about starting CrossFit football, um, you know, and that's kind of where that really grew. And you know, I remember coming down and uh, you know visiting you down in San Diego when you were still living on base, and us going over the original kind of CrossFit football workouts. How should this look? And I mean, sit, literally sit. sitting there when you say that too, we had like a binder kind of like the one in front of me, like a, basically a, yeah, a paper uh, binder yeah. and we were writing down workouts, workouts. like this sounds is fucking 300 awful. reps too much. <laughs> and we we're sitting, I remember we we're sitting in your backyard around uh, like a fire pit. It was a Costco fire, fire pit, pit. Yeah. yeah, with no fire, which was even more funny. We were out of propane at the time. Yeah, oh, fucking, you know, details. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we crafted those first workouts. And what was interesting it's like is... like 50, uh, right? Uh, first. No, it was, uh, it was 300 was how many we ended up with. So we have... Uh, there's there's a, um, something I have floating around. It's like the original 300... Cro- or the, the original 300 CrossFit football workouts. And one day we'll put it out. I mean, people always wanted it. Um, and what was interesting was some of it was so fucking awful... <laughs> That I actually <laughs> learned how to program by looking at that and being like, and then we would go do the workout and I'd be like, there's no fucking way that this has any adaptation or anything. So uh, a lot of good, uh, I guess you could say, restraint came from those workouts. It's like, oh yeah, they can do 4,000 fucking overhead squats with, you know, 405. But I will say too, from those original workouts, there were some pretty, there were some workouts that had some meat and bones. Well, I mean, to this day, the, um, and I'm sure it upsets CrossFit, the hardest CrossFit workout ever programmed courtesy of Andy Stumpf, is known as Casual. But that one, we weren't there. I, was, I called you on the phone. I was like, Andy, we're going to do hero workout. <laughs> Would she give it? And you like fucking blurted this thing out. And I was like, no, you're like, program it or you're a pussy. And I'm like, all right, we're in it. <laughs> and to this day, people are like, oh, that's the worst CrossFit workout. And then people are like, it's not a CrossFit workout. It's a CrossFit football workout. It is. Yeah, it's it's hard. Look it up. You'll you'll be able to find it. Yeah, so, Casual. So that was... I mean, that was a long way away from the symposium, though. There's oh, yeah. a lot of stuff that happened in between. Yeah, I mean, so that was really the, the beginning of CrossFit football, and then it was, uh, hey, you got to launch a website. So uh, after CrossFit, uh, you know, Lauren and, and Greg offered me to do this thing, I came back 30 days later, and we launched a website, which day one, which would have been March 31st, we had 17,000 hits in like 100-plus countries. Thir- March 31st, what year? Uh, 2009. Okay. So... Um, that was the beginning, and then uh, they said, hey, you need a seminar. So I remember we uh, we put together a seminar, and that was kind of all she wrote, and uh, we started teaching this CrossFit football method. And then I remember just the friction with CrossFit starting, and it just like, it went from like, hey, uh, you know, we were the, uh, you know, the new baby in the block. I mean, everybody was fucking, like, we were the, the apple of the teacher's eye to the fucking, you know, slutty 13 year old girl that nobody wants to invite over to their house i mean it was a fucking like a night and day i was like i thought you guys asked me to do this and we were friends and you were supporting me now all you guys are doing is trying to erode me and undermine me every fucking step of the way and i know where it started uh there was a military gig that uh, greg and them were at and uh, they came in and they were teaching and all the questions were about cross football how you know strength templates this and this and uh, all of a sudden, through paranoia or whatnot, then it looked like we were trying to take over and they had to fucking destroy us. And I remember being like, when Greg called and told me this, I was like, come on, dude. Like, you fucking asked me to do this thing. I was going to go to law school. Yeah. And I don't so, know if you would have graduated, but I like where your head was at. Oh, uh, dude, I would be a fucking attorney right about now, just <laughs> crushing it, driving around a Porsche in uh, Southern California, you know, with Ray-Ban sunglasses on. 
For those of you who've never met or seen John, he's six foot thirteen. <laughs> Uh, I'm six six. Yeah, he's not a small individual. I cannot imagine you like buttoned up in a suit and tie, making a verbal argument, like just smashing your head or uh, hit your head. That would actually be more impressive. My than brother, your hand. my brother Eddie is, uh, you know, one of like the top lawyers in Southern California. Um, he has a slightly different build than you. Though. Yeah, he's a little bit smaller. Um, and dude, he, uh, you know, and I remember him telling me like when I wanted to do, you know, when Cross had offered me, he's like, dude, just go to law school. Three years, you're out. We'll go into practice together. I have so much business. I need you to do this. And I was like, well, I think I'm going to try this fitness thing for a little. The fuck was I thinking? Yeah, but you know, if you hadn't gone down that road, we would, probably wouldn't have been sitting here. We wouldn't have been. So not at all. The leap from CrossFit football to what is now power, power athlete. athlete. What would you say? Is it the same thing? Is it different? Is it more oh, focused? Oh, it's uh, it's it's 180 degrees different. So what what I was asked to do with CrossFit football was I was asked to. So the way it was explained to me was CrossFit sits in the middle with fitness. They wanted bookends. They wanted a uh, endurance deal for endurance community with Brian McKenzie and CrossFit Endurance. And then they wanted side on the power sports like CrossFit football, power, you know, CrossFit power, something like that, mm -hmm. sitting on the other sports that they could effectively go in and win the hearts and the minds of all high school, like football, track, you know, like just anything that involved big horsepower, short duration. And so that was what was explained to me. The, uh, you know, and then in a drunken tirade, as Greg screamed at me, people want to be powerful, not elite. And I was like, yeah, fuck yeah, they do. Um, but, it, it was it, like that was the way the mission was explained to me and what they wanted me to do was translate my training in terms of like strength metabolic conditioning sprinting what i knew about you know training athletes and training myself they wanted me to translate that into a language that crossfitters could understand they wanted something that was familiar to the crossfit community that was power based they just didn't want like they wanted uh, i remember being like you got to have rounds instead of sets you know like triplets couplets little short conditioning workouts and i was like i can do that I can speak CrossFit, uh, CrossFit knees, mm -hmm. and I translated my training into CrossFit. Now, what was interesting, and really where, where Power Athlete came from, is I got a, I started a blog shortly after I started CrossFit football because I got about 200 and fucking emails a day from people asking questions. And like, you know, back then people were really willing to share, and there wasn't like a lot of information out there. It was so a I, void of information, I would was, say. Huge. And I started res responding to these emails, like by every one. Feeling like that, like they emailed me and I owed them something. And then you realized you had not enough time in the day. So I started a blog called Talk to Me Johnny. Yep. I was sitting there and. Um, TTMJ for short. TTMJ. I was sitting there watching my favorite movie or documentary rather about this uh, drifter named John Rambo. Uh, you know, gets roughed up by a small town cop, you know. Yeah. And. Um, Familiar you know, with the story. <laughs> and there's a line in there where it's Kevin Leader to Raven. Talk to me, Johnny. And I thought, man, this will be perfect. So I started talking to me, Johnny, and you know, 300 blog posts. And what's hilarious is people like seven years ago, like something I wrote, people will still like post it and talk about it. And I'm like, dude, I wrote that a long time ago. But um, powerful, especially I think, especially I think when it comes to writing, this stuff is powerful and it transcends a lot of the time. Like the verbal word for whatever reason doesn't. Sometimes it sticks with me, but if you can find something like that and it reads you and it sits you back, like okay. That stands the test of time for sure. Yeah, I mean that uh, that forty two things I'd learned up to two thousand and thirteen like awesome went, went, went viral. I mean, we had something like twenty seven million hits. I mean, it was some like astronomical to the point where I had to like pay more for WordPress hosting because of the <laughs> amount of spike. They like all of a sudden ding my credit card. And I'm like, what? Oh wait, the hosting went up by like tw you know uh, twenty yeah probably. like twenty x. And it was uh, that that went viral, and it was just basically life lessons that you know my grandmother and my mom and people have had just told me that I remember they used to live by like uh, you know it's better to live like a farmer than a bartender, and then all of a sudden a bunch of people that were bartenders got butt hurt, and I'm like I'm sorry, dude. Like my grandmother told me it's better to get up early, fucking work all day, come home, go to bed when it gets dark, than fucking hang out with the drunks. I'm fucking sorry that's your job, but that's the way it rolls. Well, they missed that it's not necessarily talking about bartenders per se; it's more metaphorical in that sense. Well, people have this. Deep Deal where um, on the internet, anything that's said is like a personal counterpoint and they can't understand the general. They can only understand. And I, I'll, I'll quote Greg Oxman on this and that uh, people fail at the margins of their experience. You I know? would agree with that for sure. I mean, he said that to me and I was like, I don't know if he stole that or he made that up, but that might be one of the more impactful things anybody's ever said to me in that people fail at the margins of their experience because, you know, you know, your experience takes you here and you can only, most people can only understand a situation based off their own, uh, you know, experience. And it takes 
either an educated or intelligent person to empathize or even put themselves in the, in the, like embody the other person to see where, you know, to see that counterpoint. To treat it as a two way mirror instead of a one essentially. Well, I always think for you, um, you know, in your job, uh, you know, being as a seal, like going out on target and like kind of thinking like, what do we think these guys are going to be like? I know what we're going to do. What mm-hmm. do we think they're going to do? And you're probably sitting there being like, if I was that dude, I'd be hiding right there. And sure enough, he's there. We and- spent 90, high 90th percentile of our planning not trying to say, hey, this is, remember, you guys, remember how we do this? Like, no, no, no. That's that's what we trained to. It was, what's the most dangerous course of action? What's the most likely course of action? What's the most deadly course of action? We would just break down everything we were going to do. And to really plan effectively, you basically spend your time thinking about your enemy or your opponent, depending yeah. on what environment you're in. And yeah, you war game it out. If they do this, what am I going to do? Just yeah. to try to stay a step ahead. And so you're not trying to be reactive in the moment. Well, I mean, it's the same thing in football. I mean, I, I used to watch guys on film and you look and you, you know, when I, you know, when the, the money's on the line and they got to get a third down stop and it's third and short, we know that those dudes are going to pinch. We know this dude's going to do this because he's done this fucking every time. Did All- they really get that? habitually repetitive oh yeah i mean dude uh uh you know i can think of um you know uh you know when i was playing for the eagles our defensive coordinator uh jim i can't remember he since passed away i can't remember his name his last name for the life of me uh if if there was a if there was a situation where we needed something he would start screaming you know casino which was an all-out blitz and they knew that they were going to bring everybody they could even if we got burned they were going to hit the quarterback and fucking knock him out of the game and I remember being like, oh, like like looking at the situation, I'm like, they're going to fucking call a casino. They're going to get burned, but they're going to light the quarterback up or hurt somebody. Yeah. And uh, even he lets go low the ball, and that's going to be the difference. And it fucking worked all the time. So, so how, I mean, long did, how long did you play ball for in your life? I mean, we'll get to the NFL, um, but when did you actually first? 14, freshman in high school. So you didn't pick up a football? You didn't play pop No, I thought it was stupid. I thought football was the dumbest sport on the planet. I thought it looked like a bunch of big fat guys pushing each other around. I didn't understand it. I never watched it. And I didn't. And I, I never had dreams of ever wanting to play, ever play football. So what changed your mind about that impression? Uh, my brothers told me all the cool guys in high school play football. That'll actually do it when and, you're in high school. And uh, <laughs> it will. And, y- you know, I've, I've told the story. Um, uh, you know, I got into martial arts. Uh, my, my brother, Rob, got his butt kicked when he was about 10 years old. And my dad... Uh, my dad's not a fighter. Um, so, but he's, you know, been a lawyer and smart enough to know that, uh, you he know, fights in different ways, not with his fists. Yeah. He's not, yeah. I don't think my dad's ever been in a fist fight. Um, but my dad was smart enough to realize that, you know, um, if he couldn't do it, somebody should. So he took my brother down to, uh, like the karate studio. This guy, John Habura had a, a martial arts studio. So we, um, he takes my brother down after a couple of weeks, my brother started beating up on my other brother and I. And so my dad took all three of us down and I fucking loved it. Uh, I went every single day. Um, I was like, I'll come seven days a week. I love the training part. I love the, uh, I love like the hard floor. I love this. I mean, the throws, I mean, fucking it hurt. And, um, they were fucking, uh, it, it was old school, like Japanese style stuff where like mm-hmm. the dude had like a, uh, a bamboo boken and we'd be like in a horse stance and he'd come over and he'd fucking whack you if you got lazy. <laughs> I mean, shit today. I mean, this is. This is thirty five years ago. Or yeah, you're getting you're getting carted off in uh, silver bracelets if you pull that nah, stuff. No, dude. Today. Like, I mean, he um, like I was punching, and my thumb was out, and he like twisted my thumb back and like dislocated my thumb, and then like reset it, and I was like, okay. Yeah. I mean, like that level of stuff. I mean, it was it was pretty brutal. I mean, we punched, and and uh, and my brothers and I used to go early and train, and I loved it. And then um, I, I thought kicking was kind of dumb after a while, and I went and I tried to do some kickboxing stuff, but I just really liked the boxing part, mm-hmm. and I just went for that, and I really really loved. Uh, just watching boxing. I remember watching like, you know, Tommy Hearns, Marvis Marvin Hagler. I remember watching Tyson and Riddick Bowe and just like all of those fighters. I mean, um, you know, uh, just to me, uh, that fighting was super impactful. I remember my dad always was a fight fan and like his, his buddies would come over and we would watch fights. And um, I remember, you know, training, you know, working the speed bag in the hands and this and just learning to cut people off in the ring. And to me, um, that was what I really liked to do. And that had to have helped you later on in your career. Um, you know what the scouting report was on me in the NFL? A boxer with a helmet on? No, fast. Uh, his hands are faster than everybody else's. Once he gets his hands on you, and um, he can always play two-thirds in the side out. I mean, so when you box, you learn to cut people off in the ring, and my hand speed was far fa- far better than other people's. And for and, people who are unfamiliar, you were an offensive lineman, right? Yeah, I played was- guard and tackle. That's the same position, but on the other either side of the center. Yeah, so I played uh, directly to the to the left of the center when yeah. I was in Philadelphia. So I played left guard for five years, and then I played uh, right tackle for the Chiefs for four or three years, and then I played right guard for a year with the Chiefs, 
and then but I also played left tackle and I played all the other positions. And for people to understand what I'm talking about with the speed of the hands, just watch a pro football game, but only watch the linemen. Yeah. You guys are going to town. Well, that and also um, I learned fairly easy uh, or fairly quickly, um, you know, about closing distance. And the one thing that I always loved was how Tyson could get in close on a guy and fucking punish his body. And I used to take that same approach, but I used to use what I called my third fist, which was my head. <laughs> so we wore these helmets, which are, you know, eight, eight to nine pounds of fucking hard plastic. Yeah. And I was able to actually punch on guys and then I would let them absorb in. And then I could, uh, un like, un like basically, uh, extend and like unlock my hips like like fucking straight and like you know you have a universal athletic position i could extend yeah with my head and literally fucking jab and like hit them like with like repeated blows but never lose position which is um is that legal to use your head like that yeah i mean I've, frowned I've, upon, it's perhaps. Frowned upon. <laughs> but it was one of those things where i i just learned to do it naturally from boxing like how to get in close yeah. and then how to you know cut, you know move and play with distance and then the problem is a lot of guys do what's called lunging where they try to do the same thing, but they fucking shoot their load and then they fucking get swum, they get beat and they, they get out of position. I could do it without ever losing position and I could always keep in a good athletic position doing it. So yeah, because if you lunge and fully extend, you got nowhere to, once you reach that max distance, you got nowhere to go. Right? Yeah, and, and you're extended, you can't move your feet. I could do it where I would like basically fucking little short, like explosive lunge it, like you know, extension lunge kind of deal, but I didn't lose position to the point where like, you know, I'm, we're watching film and, uh, at the Eagles. And I remember my offensive line coach, like we were watching something, he watched me, you know, playing and he looked at the young guys and he's like, don't ever fucking do this. <laughs> All, if, if you guys do this, you're going to get cut. And they were like, what do you mean? They were like, you know, Johnny's one of the only people I've ever seen that can do this. And like, and I remember joking, like that was my skill set. Yeah. And I looked at it like I would put my head through it. Like, you know, this probably isn't, uh, fuck it. This is probably the venue to say it if I'm ever going to say it. But, um, I looked at it like, uh, like a boxer, like Tyson, I'm going to come out fast. I'm going to lay big fucking nasty blows. I'm going to try to hurt you early and yeah. I want you to give up. And I knew that I could go out early with the fucking prefontaine suicide pace and I could take big nasty blows, big head shots, fucking try to hurt them. And, uh, most people would give up and they didn't want to play anymore. I mean, you have to assume that the guy that, on the other side of the ball is probably thinking the same thing, right? No. Really? Even at that level? Yeah, no, dude. People don't want to take those type. People are not, mo at least most people that I played against, were not willing to take that type of punishment. Were they worried about longevity? No, they just don't like the pain. Yeah, I mean, I can't argue that. So for me, the pain, pain is not generally comfortable. Um, I mean, we were, uh, I was like, so I popped a rib out the other day. And I went and I got it reset. And um, the old man that was, the, the, the Cairo was working on me was like, man, um, did you ever break your clavicle? I was like, yeah, I broke my, my collarbone when I was like four years old. My older brother picked me up and slammed me down. I broke it. And uh, he's like, well, did they reset it? I'm like, yeah, um, it, f it dropped the next day. And then my neighbor set it in his kitchen. And then my mom made like a little dish towel sling. And I had that for a couple months. Was your neighbor at least a doctor? Yeah, he was a doctor. Okay. And so the guy's <laughs> like, wow, you were four years old. And they reset, they set your fucking shoulder without anesthetic in a hospital, no x-rays. The doctor just set it. And I was like, yeah. And he's like wow, that's a pretty good pain threshold. I'm yeah. like, yeah, when I was probably 10 years old, I got a cavity and I had the guy drill my tooth uh, for the cavity without Novocaine because I wanted to see what it felt like. And the doctor was like, he's like, I haven't seen grown adults like, you know, be able to drill this thing. And then he's like, you didn't flinch. I mean, I dislocated fingers and reset them. Like I took a helmet to the shin and broke my leg clean in half and Ugh. played three weeks later, played 17 weeks with a broken leg. Uh, so No, thank you. So for me... Um, but Pain. that started so that started at fourteen though. How was your first season of freshman football? Uh, awful. <laughs> what well, did you play uh, line? Yeah, I played defense, the defensive line, offensive line. Um, uh, you know, like football is a really interesting game um, in that it it's like it doesn't make a lot of sense, and like you kind of have to make sense of it yourself. Like I don't really, like, and I still joke like I don't know all the rules. Yeah. Like, you know, things like they like throw a penalty or something happened. I'd be like, I don't know what the fuck that just is about. And then like somebody would explain it. I'd be like, oh, okay, it makes sense. They'd be like, how do you not know that? I'm like, man, uh, I don't touch the ball. My only job is that I got to like basically just like whoop this dude's ass for three hours and that's good. And like I'll compartmentalize. I don't like, I'll tell you what everybody else can do. Like if you ask me, hey, what, you know, what route are they running? I probably know. But for the most part, like I'm not concerned with that. Hey, like you focused I'm, on your job. Yeah. Which is one on one fist fighting a dude. 
trying to, you know, basically prove how good or bad I am every Sunday in front of millions of people 70 times. So got on the football field the first time your freshman year. You got a scholarship to Berkeley, right? Yeah, so I was... Um, so obviously, you. when did you start realizing, like, oh, wow, this might be the vehicle to college? Um, I didn't even realize that at all. Uh, I was... Uh, I remember I was a sophomore and I was a pretty good player. Um, you know, I just, you know, started lifting weights. I went from like 160 to like 200 in a year and uh, got way bigger, grew two inches, got stronger, went from a bench of like 115 to like 225 in like, you know, short amount of time. I struggle imagining you at 160 pounds. To be Six honest. foot 165, that's what I was a freshman <laughs> in high school. And um, so we roll in and uh, um, all of a sudden, like, uh, I start getting like uh, letters from schools. So there was a pretty good, my, my training partner was a guy named Tasso Papadakis, who was a Greek kid. And he was like the strongest kid in America under 16. He squatted like 500 for 10 at 15. At 15? Yeah. F- yeah, 500, four, yeah, 495 with college for 15, for 10 reps at 15 years old. That's monumentally impressive. Yeah, and he looked the part. He yeah. looked like a pro bodybuilder at 15. Yeah, just an action figure? Oh, dude, it, insane. I've, I've, to this day, I've never seen a kid more physically developed than him. And, you know, he went on to play fullback and linebacker for SC and had, you know, tore some ACLs and, you know, didn't really get to where he wanted to go in terms of playing the NFL. But he was a world-class player and school showed up to watch him. And I was just some lanky kid too. And I was his training partner and school started sending me letters. And then uh, I filled them out, sent them back and had a pretty good, you know, kept playing, kept playing, kept playing. And the next thing I know, I had a gang scholarship offers. So double major at Berkeley, right? Uh, well, I, I graduated in four years and then did my master's in my fifth year. What do you have your degrees in? Uh, rhetoric and education. But you can't spell. Uh, <laughs> I'm not good at proofreading. I have screen grabs that I'll, that I'll post that prove that it's <laughs> T-H-E, not T-E-H. No, it's uh, – and I ask those questions because I think most people like myself who had never met a professional uh, football player before meeting you – you're kind of taken aback. You would think, and same thing as people who meet military guys. Oh, they're just some meathead, meathead dude. But and then the reality is, most of the people are are meatheads. Some of them are. Some are educated. Some are intelligent. Some are both. But there, it's it to me. I have found it surprising. And you know, I just it's when I first met you, I was like, damn, dude. There's a lot of layers to the uh, to the onions besides just taping your hands up and using them as as clubs. Yeah, I mean, but I um probably one of the, I mean, I. I I will tell you, the life I lived in the NFL was fucking beyond the coolest thing you could ever do. I, I wish everybody in their in their, Oh, we're getting there. Don't worry. I wish everybody got to be a 10-year <laughs> NFL player and like live that life. It was fucking cool as shit. But for me personally, uh, one of the best times in my life, um, and being a dad and having kids is, and you know, being married has been epic too, so I can't it's say It's a different epic, but I agree yeah, with you. But being in college, uh, to me, was probably uh, one of the, the most special, most amazing points in my life. And I'll tell you why. I got to go to school uh, to UC Berkeley, which is like a, a cornucopia of, uh, of a, you know, ideas, attitudes, you know, right, left, middle, center, I mean, it, everything. Would you say it still is? Um, yeah, I mean, it it is. Um, I think you only see a lot of the negative and a lot of the bullshit. I mean. You but, see what makes the news. You don't yeah. see the rest of the stuff. Yeah. But what was cool was I got to go to this place. Um, I got to play football. Uh, and you know, lift weights and train and play football. But the cooler part was I got to finally, cause I, in, in high school, like they have you take the classes, like you have to take all these classes. Mm-hmm. I wasn't necessarily inspired by much, even though I got decent grades and a good SAT score. It just wasn't like something we felt like it was missing in the education space for me. Well, it's not your path. It's the high school path. Yeah. You need X, you need Y. Once you get these, then you're, we will allow you to graduate. Exactly. So then, um, I graduated, go to Berkeley and I remember them being like, what classes do you want to take? And I was like, I, why? I don't know. And I sat down and they were like, okay, well, um, you know, let's give you an education class. Let's do this, this. And I gave me a kind of like a really diverse roster that first semester or in, in that first year. And I remember I had to take on English. So it was like, do you want to take like English lit? Do you want to take rhetoric? And I was like, what's this rhetoric thing? And they were like, oh, it's um, uh, like an argumentative English philosophy thing. And I'm like, in, I'll take rhetoric one. And all of a sudden I go in there and I got this like education 40 class with Pedro Nogueira. And I remember he walks in the first day and he says, if you're white and you're a male, you're the problem and you're the oppressor. And here's the pro and, and here's what you need to know. You need to know that's how people think of you. So get used to it. It's a strong opening for day one class. Yeah. And I mean, this is, you know, 1994. And I remember being like, okay, like if I'm the oppressor, then you know what I need to realize instead of being upset about it. I need to understand my position and how people are viewing me and I need to work within this framework. 
and hmm. I need to somehow guide through it. And I remember, uh, like, I never wear any of my football stuff to school. You know, I never, you know, I wore glasses. Uh, How was the Berkeley football team? Do they do uh, it's a D one school? Yeah, yeah, it? we were Pac ten. Okay. I mean, we didn't do well when I was there, but it's a good school. You know, good football school. Um, but I didn't really like, you know, ever pub up to my teacher that I was a football player or this. And he just said, Hey man, like just fucking be a student. Yeah. And, uh, I remember going to my rhetoric class and like sitting down and like them being, Hey, we're going to read these books and you're going to write and stuff. And I'm like, fuck, this is great. I remember I went and like just started reading and it was as if like everything opened to me. And, uh, I remember I, I like aced that class and I was like, this is great. And, uh, I had, I was like, man, I think I'm going to do this for a major. I'd love to be a rhetoric major. And then I was like, ah, you know what? Maybe it'd be smarter to be like a business major. So I took all the business classes and calculus and this. And I remember, uh, like working my ass off, like, and it was like, I was going for this and all of a sudden this is like my third year and I, uh, tear my ACL. Um, like, like towards the end of the year, all of a sudden I have ACL, like ACL reconstruction and I'm trying to like crutch to classes and study and like fucking, uh, I got like C's on everything and I studied my ass off and I remember I still had a rhetoric class and, uh, I literally didn't study for anything. I just read the books. I went in and it was like a plus. And I remember being like, dude, all I had to do is read the books. All of this stuff made sense to me. I, I really enjoyed taking the final. I aced it. And then this other shit I put in like, you know, 20 hours a day studying for, and I barely pulled a C and I'm like, you know, maybe in life you look for what you have aptitude for. Yeah. Instead of square peg and round, round hole, hole and just driving it in with a jackhammer. Yeah. And, uh, forcing it. And I was like, you know what, I'm not going to do any of that business stuff. And I just went and did all the rhetoric and uh, I took like a rhetoric, a poetry class, which is, is so funny because I still, to this day, like last night when we were talking, um, still to this day, I remember sitting in this guy, Will West, uh, po uh rhetoric, a poetry class, which is so ironic. Like how can you make an argument about a po about a poem? But it was, um, they asked me what my favorite poem was and I got up and I read, you know, uh, you know, Dylan Thomas, you know, um, do not go gentle into that good night, rage, rage against the dying of light. Like that poem to me was, was like who I was, you know, that, um, you know, I was not going to go gentle. I was not going to fucking to go away soft that I was going to fucking stand up and fight for this thing and uh, fight in life. Um, you know, it's like, uh, uh, you know, reading, uh, El uh, or, uh, Eldritch's, um, you know, wild at heart or some of these mm -hmm. things like, um, you know, and I remember reading all this stuff about, uh, you know, uh, you know, different poets. And I remember reading the history and being like, dude, this guy was a, uh, he was a, he was a poet. He was a fighter. This guy was a king. He was like, and so I realized that there was like this warrior poet thing. And I thought to myself, I can be a scholar. I can be an athlete. I can be a professional athlete. I can do all of these things. I don't have to be one dimensional. I can weld and I can do this and I can create and I can be this Renaissance man. And, um, to me, like, that's what I wanted in my life. I didn't ever want to be one dimensional. I wanted this person that could do everything. I wanted to be able to read and write and present and speak and, uh, you know, uh, fucking lift weights and train and fight and fit. Like I wanted everything. Yeah. And, um, you know, going there, that was a cool realization. And I did, I mean, I, I, you know, I graduated in four years and then I went on to, you know, grad school and was a, you know, student, you know, taught, taught in the Oakland uh, public school district, got drafted by the Philadelphia Eagles in the fourth round, came in and started as a rookie. And I'm like, dude, I graduated from Berkeley, uh, you know, and like have all this, um, you know, knowledge base. And now I get to go out and be a professional athlete. And I was like feeling like I was, uh, approaching what I wanted to do in terms of this idea of being like a Renaissance man, like more than just this one dimensional person. How was the jump from college ball to pro ball? Uh, the jump from high school to college was way more dramatic than college to the NFL. Really? Yeah. Is it because you were closer in capacity? I mean, cause yeah. when I was 18 and where I was when I was 24 is night and day. But when yeah. I threw buds, I was 150 pounds. By the Dude. time I was in my early twenties, I was probably 192 inches taller. Yeah. So, well, the thing, thing about this, like, okay, your senior in college is like 22, 23 years old. I come in as like a 17, 18 year old kid. I didn't even own a razor. Yeah. And I'm like this young kid coming in, you know, I'm like, Hey, what's happening? Let's go lift weights. And then uh, all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> I feel I, like you didn't sound like that, yeah. but I like the, uh, <laughs> yeah. like your voice is cracking. You're like, okay, don't kick my ass, you know? And, uh, then the difference of being a 24, you know, year old man who weighs 300 pounds and fucking benches 500 stepping on the field with 27, 30, 32 year old men way different of similar size and scale and capacity. Yeah. So it only took me, uh, a pretty short amount of time to become a starter in the NFL. Yeah. I can only, I mean, so you played a decade. 
which yeah. what's the average stat right now? About 3.3, yeah, 3.1. 3 but that number's misleading. How so? Because um, in the NFL, you either can do it and you do it for 10 or 12 years, or you fucking have a cup of coffee and it kick you in the ass. And then call yourself an NFL player the rest of your life? Yeah, I mean, like you have a guy like Peyton Manning or Tony Gonzalez and these dudes play 17 years. And you're like, for every dude that did that, there's a guy that just showed up, uh, you know, got his jersey, had a cup of coffee, and they fucking booted him. Yeah. And is the world, I mean, you kind of alluded to it, the world and the life is probably what people would expect it to be? Yeah. Some of the stories you've told me over the years are like, what? Yeah. <laughs> what was... uh What's interesting to me about that world is I think most people have an idea of what going from having no money to that type of money, whatever they think that type well, of money is. Well, here's the thing, man, and this is part of the thing that I was getting to in the, um, when I was in college and part of why I enjoyed it. Uh, my scholarship check was 740 bucks a month. My parents kicked me an extra 300 so I had about 1000 bucks a month to live on. My rent was 475 and so our bills were about 25 bucks. Uh, I lived next door to a supermarket, made friends with the meat cutter, and he used to like, you know, give us the discount specials. I mean, I had 500 bucks a month to live on. Yeah. So, like, I remember going to the ATM and I would never take out more than $20 at a time because I would spend more than, because if I took out. I remember out, going to the ATM and be worried about having 20 bucks come out. I just remember being like, <laughs> as long as I got 20 bucks, I'm okay. Yeah. And then, like, you can, like, go get, like, you know, Steve's Korean chicken and rice for three ninety nine, and, like, the dude would give us extra, or my buddy who bartended at Henry's who, like, you know, we never paid for a drink or, you know, dollar wells here. And, and, um, but here's the thing, man. Everybody was poor. So, like, we didn't know. Like, we just knew everybody was broke. Yeah. And uh, there was no stress, no taxes, no mortgages. People paid their rent. Uh, you know, towards the end of the month, like, people were, like, eating beans and rice and hoping to God to yeah, get some chicken breast. You're making it work, man. You're yeah. trying to spend until your next paycheck. And that, to me, was, like, uh, all my books were paid for. So, like, I had, like, every book. And I could read uh, as much as I wanted. And, like... I didn't have to like dress and I didn't, you know, I didn't have a watch. I drove, you know, I had a, a shitty motorcycle and like, it just, um, it was such a simple, simple existence where like, I'm here to absorb knowledge and play football. And like, uh, you know, and I remember there were dudes who were like, you know, like, you know, trying to do this and this. And I'm like, man, I, I really just enjoy being, and I know this is crazy. Just enjoyed not having really anything. Yeah. It was, it, it was like, cause I always like think a, like, uh, not that you were like a monk or, but what people would associate that with, they have no, like no external possessions and they focus on yeah, it, what they have with their hands. It, it was like, uh, I had, you know, clothes. I mean, I literally, like, I, I remember I, I, I bought my motorcycle for 300 bucks and I sold it for 300 bucks. I paid, uh, I paid, you know, 80 bucks for the helmet and I sold it for 80 bucks. And I remember I packed up my, I had a, a 90 uh, or a Ford Bronco. Uh, when I left there and I packed it up for, I literally packed everything I had in the Ford Bronco and drove it to Philadelphia. And I remember the first night I rented a place, I slept on the floor and the next day I went and I bought furniture. Yeah. You know, and I remember I bought a bed and I went to Ikea cause I was like, fuck, I'm not spending a lot of money. I might not be here that long. Yeah. And, and to me, like, I just remember that I went from basically having 20 bucks in my bank account to having a lot more in my bank account. And that's where the question where I was going to try to, to go to with it. I would assume that most people playing in college ball are, are, I guess, depending on their family background, are probably in that situation. I have no idea the actual money that uh, people get paid into the NFL, but obviously I think the minimum salary now, what is four to $500,000? Sure. Let's just say that most people probably make more than that, especially if they are farther into their career. Sure. So you saw and yourself went from a place where Money was a limiting factor to depending on what you were going to get paid. It wouldn't necessarily be a limiting factor. And my question would be, because I'm like large sums of money to me don't necessarily make sense. Like to me, I value my wealth on being able to drive the car that I want to drive. And when I go to dinner with my wife and kids, I can order whatever the hell I want. Yeah. It, well, that's simplistic. Uh, and that's, and like there's, um, so my question is, there, well, well, what look, are the mistakes that you saw people making? Well, here's the thing. Okay. So, uh, like I used to be big into motorcycles and I remember uh, me and my buddy, uh, I think you met Bundy. Did you remember I think me? Teddy? I did actually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Teddy and I went to Daytona bike week and we used to go to Daytona every year. I went with RC and the guys and we went to Daytona and I remember uh, it was just Bundy and I, and we like packed up the bikes and we rode up to this place called Peggy's place. And I remember on the marquee, it said Van Zandt band. And, uh, we come in and like, you know, RC used to tattoo at this trailer next door. And I remember we're sitting in the back drinking beer in this like fucking picnic tables with these old fat fucking bikers. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like Leonard Skinner playing their warm up show because they're going to play on the beach in Daytona to 100,000 the next night. And I remember sitting there and being like, oh shit, like this is Johnny Van Zandt, like this is fucking Leonard Skinner. And uh, all of a sudden, they start playing Simple Man. 
And I don't know a lot about country, so I don't. Well, it's, I don't it, know their records. Yeah, so Leonard Skinner, <laughs> yeah, the country, uh, Southern rock, but they play a song Skinner uh, called "Simple Man." One of it's my like, favorites. It's 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 fucking dude. That like I was, it was such a surreal thing. I'm sitting there at these picnic tables in like Ormond Beach at this fucking biker joint called Peggy's Place, I think, and it's like Leonard Skinner playing "Simple Man," and it was the first I'd, I'd heard the song before, but it was the first time I actually heard the music and heard the lyrics and it was like, don't rich for, or don't lust for the rich man's gold. You know, everything you have is in your soul. Like, you know, and his mom is saying like, just be a simple man. And I remember that song and like those lyrics hitting me to the point where I was like, fuck man, that's a secret of life. Simple. And, um, yeah, and, I mean, so and, how often did you see people come into the world you were in and had that money in the opposite would, direction? Well, what they were trying to do is add complexity to their life. Like I watched dudes who were married with kids with four girlfriends and houses, you know, spec, you know, different cars and fucking ulterior lives and different cell phones. And I watched guys like do all this, like, you know, have all this shit and just like endless amounts of fucking layers to the point where uh, just the thought of like the amount of shit and layers and complexity and bullshit they were doing in their lives gave me fucking anxiety. And I remember being like, the secret of life is fucking simple. Like, um, you know, have a house you can afford that you like, um, you know, don't like, don't live beyond your means. Like I fucking have driven the same pickup truck since 2006 and I paid it off. I, I don't like car payments. You've had that and, truck since I've known you. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and I literally will drive the wheels off it. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I work on cars and like, you know, like a, a blazer, I traded a motorcycle for and dude, you parted out a motor and like, uh, I could definitely drive. And if, you know, I had a twin turbo Porsche and like some Epic stuff and like, well, I, you're going to have to explore the space a little bit. I would assume when you go from that, what you do, like yeah. I, like you kind of do this thing where I remember I, um, I walked into a car dealership to look at some cars and like the dude was kind of rude to me a little bit. <laughs> And I ended up behind a Porsche and I remember driving it and a semi lost a tire in front of me and ripped the whole side of the car off and like this. And they totaled the car and they, and I paid like 115 grand for it. And they handed me a check for like 85. And I remember being like, fuck you. I will never own an expensive car like this again. And yeah. I never did it. And that was the last one I ever bought. I never but I bought another Porsche, never did this. And I, I just was like, this is stupid. They're going to total this thing. The guy said, well, they can't repaint it and this. And the fucking guy totaled it. And I was young. What I should have done is he probably was going to sell it to his buddy and make money. I didn't know I could buy the car. Uh, long story short. Um, you could have turned it into a pet project. You could have crushed yeah, that thing. And, yeah. And so, um, but like to me, it was about like, you know, what do I do well? And like um, I realized too that uh, the richness in your life, like I, I like think about this, like like when you lay on your deathbed, when you're laying there, like your final moments, the last thing you're gonna think about is all the shit that you bought. The physical possessions, yeah. It, 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 it does think. You know what you're gonna remember? You're gonna remember your memories. You're gonna you're gonna look around. You're gonna see who's sitting there, and uh, or who's you know who's fucking there holding your hand, or more importantly, like the memories that you were able to, you know, bring together with your friends and the influences in this. Like, that's what people are going to remember. They're not going to remember that you had two fucking Range Rovers or a, a private jet or this. You know what people are going to remember? How you treated them. Yeah. And more importantly, you're going to remember the experiences that you had. And not like, you know, uh, we went to Vegas and fucking ride. Like, like they're going to remember, you know, um, sitting on your beach or sitting at, you know, on a lake, you know, come visit in Montana and like teaching my son how to skip stones. I would say they'll remember how you treated them. And then also if you want to have something extend beyond your deathbed and beyond yourself, they'll remember the difference that you made in their life and the example that you set for them. That's how I view my kids. I mean, that's t the only way I can impact the world around me is by passing that forward generationally. And I have three kids and hopefully they'll have. Yeah. No more than two each because it's a handful when you get to three, as know. you know. Yeah. And but that can sequentially continue forward, and then just that domino effect of it gains momentum along the way. Yeah, I mean, it's um, you know part of the reason that we packed up everything we moved to Austin. The big thing was, uh, you know, uh, we I was working a ton. I didn't get to see my kids as much, and I was like, you know what, this is bullshit. I'm going to build everything on the property. I want my kids to play outside. I want them to run up to the building, and I want everything to be closer. And um, you know, I want to like. And it was weird. I, I read this study where they said like two hours of uninter un uninterrupted noises or sounds of nature is like taking like six uh, Xanax or something. They related it. I can buy but, that. But they were like saying like, 
part of the reason that people have such um, like anxiety in this is that they are so disconnected from nature and like just like sitting out there and hearing the noises is like therapeutic. And uh, I wanted to wake up and see wildlife. I didn't want to see neighbors. I didn't want to hear 450 planes a day going over my house in John Wayne uh, because we lived in John Wayne's flight path in Dover Shores. Yeah, you did. uh, (laughs) Which is a beautiful fucking place. But dude, I I was like, I, I remember waking up one morning and being like, baby, we can't live here no more. Like we got to go. And, um, so how's it been? Cause uh, you, you beat me by about six months out of well, California. I remember I told you I sold the house and moved and you were like, we're fucking out of here too. <laughs> and it was just about the time that I moved. Cause we got out here right about the first, uh, right after Christmas, like a day. And then I remember you guys were in Montana for Christmas and you came back yep. and you said, dude, we're not coming back. That was, to it. That was truly the, the straw that broke the camel's back. And it wasn't, it was a combination of small things, but more than anything, it was the difference I saw in the kids. Yeah. Like, please come inside. You're purple. You're hypothermic. I need you. Go play your video game for 20 minutes by the fire, as opposed to California, where it's like, give me your phone and your video game and go outside. It just was a completely different environment. No, I mean, and, and um, I wanted to have a gym on the property. Like, I wanted to have my own weights. I wanted to have a, like a place where I could work on my stuff. And I wanted to be able to have like an office and all that. And uh, we were able to build it here. And like, I want my kid. And here, here's the thing too. I always think about this. Like, I always wonder how I will be remembered, not by people that didn't know me, but by my own children. And, uh, those are the only memories are, yeah. I mean, but, anyway. but, but, but that's what people are always like, Oh my, uh, you know, when, uh, somebody writes my obituary and this, and I'm like, I don't really give a shit on the obituary thing, which is written for like somebody telling people about you. I want my kids to reflect back and be like, tell them stories about, uh, uh, uh like tell them stories about their dad. Be like, ah, uh, when I was like six years old, uh, my dad, you know, we were five, like we packed up, we moved everything to Austin on this like ranch and like, you know, and like tell these stories and like, you know, my dad like piece of shit, old trucks. And, uh, we used to like ride around on the property in them and, uh, you know, his buddies used to like show up and it just so happened that all of his buddies are like world famous Navy SEALs and these guys and here. And it's like, I want them to have these memories to be like, Oh, you mean, you know, uncle Andy and uncle Dave and these guys. And then like them growing up and then like reading stories about these people yeah, and then realizing like, Holy shit, like these were my dad's friends and, uh, or, you know, something like the power athlete symposium. And I remember them being like, so all these people come to hang out with you guys. Like, and then like them seeing like, you know, not only did I, um, have this really killer experience to go to college and then, you know, go out and play in the NFL, um, but it was, um, it, you know, and then be able to go into this other kind of, you know, different career in terms of, you know, performance. And what's, what's really kind of interesting is, uh, when I started down this path, I mean, uh, just being a fairly introspective, like, like constant, yeah, yeah, like introspective, like constantly looking in within myself, like kind of trying to figure it out. It was like a splinter in my mind. And the only thing I can say is, uh, I couldn't figure out what the overarching kind of umbrella for performance was. And I kept thinking like, there has to be something more. It's not fitness. It's not this, it's not muscle. It's not strength. It's not like, like, what is it? And I realized that, uh, the single greatest, um, like basically barometer or really the, the deciding factor for all human movement is athleticism. There isn't a single thing out there, whether it be the CrossFit Games or, you know, Cameron Hayes, you know, hunting or Joe Rogan, you know, like, you know, uh, fucking Conor McGregor in in the, uh, you know, on the octagon. It doesn't matter if you're playing football. The more you like the better athlete, the more athletic you are, the better you can move and um, is is really what everybody's searching for. And I sat down. I thought if if it's athleticism. And I can define athleticism and I can understand athleticism, then I can basically reverse engineer and train athleticism. Teach it, yep. And this is really what power athletes about, the idea of unlock, unlocking athletic potential and understanding how to foster and develop athleticism. And it came back, uh, I did a talk at this thing called the Black Box Summit, and they asked me to do a talk, and I've been really kind of just mentally thinking about this thing called what is athleticism? And as I, as I was creating the talk and I was writing it down, all of a sudden I had this like wonderful conversation with myself where I was like, man, this is what we've been doing. This is the technology. This is what I've been searching for my whole life. And I needed, but I I have to create a definition, right? And, uh, unlike, um, you know, like my favorite was when Glassman said, nobody defined fitness before me. Well, everybody's defined fitness. 
Uh, but I remember it being like, if it's self-serving, you know, if increased work capacity, broad time, modal domains is the self-serving definition for the training style, then I want to create a universal definition for athleticism that I can effectively support with my training style. So I, I started working on it and it was the ability to seamlessly and effortlessly combine primal movement patterns through space to accomplish a known or novel task. And that's how I defined athleticism. And then I went through and defined primal movements and, you know, time and space and seamless and effortless. And you kind of go through all these pieces and it's a, it's a, it's a roadmap for how to develop and foster athleticism and how to unlock athletic potential. And what I realized too, is that fitness, they call it a continuum, but it's really a spectrum, which I always mm -hmm. laugh about. So it's either here or there, but a continuum is a never ending line. The athleticism is a, and I call it the athleticism continuum is the fucking continuous athletic. I mean, it's, it's never ending where you start on the athleticism continuum is based off of genetics, geography, and opportunity. You know, what are the genetics, what opportunities you had and, uh, the geography, like where you born around it? Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to be a world-class elk hunter, you better grow up in Montana or somewhere where they have elk. Um, you know, world-class elk hunters probably aren't from Texas. They're good at hunting, you know, cause they probably, probably unless they moved earlier, they, they spent moved. a lot of time up in places that are yeah. elk country. Yeah. But I mean, you know, you grow up in South Texas, you hunt deer and you hunt, hunt hogs. Yeah. And, uh, so this conversation really grew and it was that moment that I realized the technology I was developing was helping people realize where they are on the athleticism continuum and then extending it forever. And I remember I gave the talk and Rob Wolf, uh, who was there too, comes over to me and he goes, Jesus Christ. He goes, dude, he goes, that was fucking unbelievable. And I was like, you like it? He goes, you just answered every question that we tried to answer when I first came into CrossFit and we thought it was fitness. He goes, if we could have, he goes, if they, if you would have given that talk in the early 2000s, it would have altered the trajectory. He's like at that. And even Rob said that it altered his complete mindset for training. It's powerful when you change and, your perspective like that. And I remember Rob being like, uh, I helped Rob put together a template and he still uses it to this day. And he's like, it's probably the best training template I've ever used. And I use it. And people ask me all the time, Rob, doing training. He's like, it's something that John wrote for me based off of his athleticism model. It works, man. We're almost out of time because they're going to come through the door in a second. I got one more question for you based off of perspective, and that is since, you know, you're the only pro baller that I know, what what do you think of the state of the current NFL? Um, I think um, in terms of guys kneeling that people have the right to silent protest. The problem is, is the NFL is a private entity. And the owners have the right to look and say, okay, this is a business. We have sponsors. We have all this other, you know, river of dirty money flowing through. And this, if, if guys kneeling is going to affect the bottom line, then we have to fix this. So you have this interesting power struggle where you have people that are private employees, you know, not a public company, not publicly traded, uh, private employees that are doing something that negatively affects the bottom line of the corporation. So, uh, like, for me, yes, people have the right to sell and protest, but they also have the right to not get hired again based off of this. Now, uh, I think it's fucking awesome for the mere fact that uh, I have never in my life hoped for the demise of something <laughs> as much as I've hoped for the demise of the NFL. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Because the owners are by far the biggest fucking crooks on the planet. Uh, did you know uh, the NFL teams are nonprofits? They have nonprofits. Stop, how dare they? Yeah, they're nonprofits. Well, anybody can be. It just means you can't show profit at the end of the year. And they don't. You know why? Because they just pay themselves big bonuses. There you go. And uh, like the river of dirty money and hustles and this and manipulation and like the fact that, uh, you know, this whole concussion thing started because they didn't want to give us health insurance past five years. So every other professional sport gives lifetime medical benefits, except the NFL, which is only five years. So after that shit came up, guys were having problems. Because, yeah. And then they lied to us. When I came in the NFL, they told me, you'll, you know you get a concussion when you get knocked unconscious. When I left the NFL, they said, you'll know you get a concussion when you hit your head and you you know, you know go cross-eyed, you feel you know, bells ring, you know, something. They've backed that off so much further than j even just that. Well, I know. But then they were like, well, I've never been knocked unconscious. And the guy said, well, what about this definition? I'm like, I don't know, 70 to 200 times a day for the last 10 years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so it, like to me, the, the teams knew about it. Uh, the owners have, I always joke, man, that like at the end of the day, those guys got paid in fucking, you know, 30 pieces of silver with Judas, you know, like those guys have made their fortunes on the backs of players and like guys killing themselves. They could give two shits. So, yeah. um, I think that they have a, uh, 
uh, vested responsibility to, it's just like in America, like you send guys over to, you know, to, uh, to war and those guys get fucked up. You have responsibility to take care of your troops. You have a responsibility to take care of your people. Like I have a responsibility to take care of my children. And you know what? Like, here's nothing. And this is just a personal rant, but like being a parent's extremely like unselfish. Kids are selfish, most selfish beings on the planet. So like I was selfish when I was a child and then you grow into it. And now it's my, my children's time to be selfish and it's an unselfish time in my life. And what drives me fucking crazy is when parents are fucking so selfish that they'd be like, oh, well, I'm just not, you know, stimulated. I'm going to do this. And you're like, okay, so you don't get the right to fucking be a shitty parent and ruin your child's life because you're not being fucking met. You had your selfish time. Be unselfish and fucking allow somebody to grow. I'm like, dude, there's a lot of shit that like I don't get to do because I have, you know, wife and kids and a responsibility. And it's like, well, I just, you know, not feeling complete. Fuck you. Be an adult. <laughs> And you know what your responsibility is? If you're going to have these little offspring, be the best fucking father you can. Yep. And you know what? Like, uh, bury that shit, you know, uh, put it aside. Like, everybody lives in this fucking, like, I have to be complete, me as emotion, and it just drives me crazy. So be a good father, uh, you, know, you know, go to sleep early, lift weights, train, you know, be nice to your wife so she doesn't drive you and the kids crazy. And, um, you know, try to just be a simple man. That's it. Let's go open the symposium. Roger that. Thanks for the support, everyone. It's been uh, been an interesting ride. I actually shouldn't have been able to post this podcast today because I should have been landing in Europe. But I'm looking out my window at the Mall of America in Minneapolis, St. Paul, where I'm currently delayed with no bags. But Delta Airlines, thank you very much for the toothbrush you gave me. I have some very colorful words that I would like to use to describe how I feel currently about that airline, but I'm going to take a pass on that. I got rebooked. Hopefully I'm taken off. Hopefully my bags will show up. I don't know. Maybe I'll hunt with rocks. We shall see. And I don't even know how I got started talking about Delta Airlines. But thank everybody for, thank you everybody for the constant support. The hats are, I'm burning through those hats at a rate faster than I ever thought possible. Sweatshirts are back in stock. Got everything loaded up in case you have that special someone that just needs a t-shirt, a sweatshirt, or a hat. One of the three. I'm just saying, I can get it to you before Christmas. Uh, but in all seriousness, thank you everybody again for the support, the reviews, the feedback, people reaching out via email. Please keep it coming. It drives me to keep doing what I'm doing. And I think the next podcast I'm going to put up will be from France. Hopefully. Maybe not. Maybe I'll just go home. I don't know. <laughs>